All right. If you were someone you know immigrated to the US from another country, you're probably familiar with the whole aspect of them having just unbelievably cool birthdays, where they're born on either December 31st or January 1st. I was born in the US, so I have a very ordinary birthday, May 12th. I'm a Taurus, whatever that means. But a lot of my family immigrated here. And as a result, a lot of them have very cool birthdays. The reason for this is because, well, things aren't documented back home the way that they are here. Birthdays, at least back then, were not really emphasized. And as a result, were usually never documented or written down. Instead, people just kind of guesstimated their birthday. Sometimes even their age when they moved here. They pretty much just made it up. So I always get a good laugh when I see the reactions to stories from people asking how a 30-year-old basketball player was able to pose as a 17-year-old and dominate in high school. It seems funny. And and crazy and, and a bit concerning that an adult is walking the halls and interacting with a bunch of minors. But what these stories fail to mention is that someone like John Nicola, the 30 year old high school basketball star, likely not only actually knows his actual age, but also isn't an isolated incident. In fact, this is part of a much bigger system among high schools, prep schools, and agents that are exploiting African athletes. The story here isn't just that John Nicola lied about his age. Sure, that's part of it. But the real story here is that John Nicola was just like so many other African athletes, likely promised a dream of leaving their country for the hope of coming to the US or Canada to play basketball. By a scout that looked at them and said, I can maybe make some money off this kid. Let's take the story of Blessing Ejiofor from Nigeria. She was recruited at a basketball camp in Africa by a scout who offered her a chance to come to the United States attend school for free and pursue her dreams of playing basketball. The scout told her that she was going to attend the Evelyn Mack Academy in Charlotte, North Carolina, which on paper looked amazing. The school's website showed a campus filled with beautiful buildings, manicured trees, and perfectly trimmed grass. Private schools in the US issue what's called an I-20, offering international students a visa to study at that school. And so armed with her hoop dreams, her newly issued visa, and a one-way ticket, Blessing left Nigeria for the first time in her life and landed in New York, ready to hop on one more plane and begin her hoop dreams at the Evelyn Mack Academy. Instead, upon landing in New York, she was greeted by a coach from Eastside High School, claiming that the host family in North Carolina was not ready to take her and that she was to come with him to New Jersey instead, where she would be living, studying, and playing basketball. Confused, but without any options, she followed the coach, unaware that what had just happened to her had happened to so many other athletes that had been promised attendance at the Evelyn Mack Academy. In fact, almost no one ended up at the Evelyn Mack Academy. It was little more than a facade. The beautiful pictures which appeared on the website were in fact just images of MIT. The real campus was in shambles and looked no bigger than a small old church at best. In reality, Evelyn Mack was nothing more than a middleman operation run by the school's founder, also named Evelyn Mack, who was providing students I-20 visas in exchange for money. So coaches at schools who were unable to issue I-20s but wanted to take advantage of the African talent pool would pay Evelyn Mack, the person, $1,000 to issue visas to their players. In total, Evelyn Mack issued 75 I-20 visas. Mind you, there were no more than 50 students even enrolled at the school. And what's worse, except for extremely rare circumstances, I-20s aren't transferable from school to school, meaning it immediately becomes invalid the moment the student stops attending the school where it was issued. So for Blessing, given she was immediately transferred to Eastside High School from Evelyn Mack, her visa was invalid the moment she stepped foot in the country, and she was never made aware of this. Now, for better or for worse, it took a while for this issue to bubble up for Blessing, who in the meantime was living comfortably with one of her coaches. And after graduating from Eastside High, a school notorious for stacking the deck with talented players from across Africa, Blessing, a highly touted recruit, received a scholarship to play for Vanderbilt University. It was only after her first season at Vanderbilt that her visa issues bubbled up. And as a result, Blessing, who was in the midst of chasing her dream playing basketball, was sent back home to Nigeria because of her invalid visa. Now, this is where we hit a fork in the road, because unlike many in her position, Blessing was able to get back to the US and continue her basketball career, this time at the University of West Virginia, where she's currently playing center for the Mountaineers. The sad reality though, is that most of these athletes don't end up as well as Blessing does in these situations. In fact, more often often than not, it ends in tragedy. Take the story of Clifford Etadifimwe, a 7-2 center from Nigeria, the same country as Blessing. Soon after arriving, Clifford's shady private school that issued him his I-20 ended up closing altogether, invalidating his visa. Without school, a place to stay, or a valid visa, Clifford soon became homeless, wandering across several different states, most notably in New Hampshire, where he was thrown to the ground and tased by officers who asked him to leave the library he was sitting in, but because of the language barrier, was unable to to understand or respond to them. Mind you, he was in the library because he was homeless and just wanted a place to sit in that was warm. A sad moment for a man that came to the US with 
all the optimism in the world, a chance to chase his dream, and only a few months later found himself with nowhere to live, pinned down by police, and tased. And again, I can't stress this enough. This is not an isolated incident. Time and again, there are instances of these athletes being brought here by greedy scouts and coaches, promising these kids and families, who by the way, are paying to send their kids to these schools, anywhere from two to $10,000 per child, only to be put in poor living conditions or abandoned. Take this group of Congolese kids who were recruited at a high school in Charleston. They were forced to live in a small, unfurnished apartment with little to no food. Keep in mind, the Congo is the poorest nation in the world, where the annual income per capita is $785 a year. These scouts were charging three years worth of income for their services. Imagine saving three years of income to pay someone to care for your child and help them chase their dreams, only for them to be put in an even worse living situation, where they may be abandoned, homeless, with no way to work, and no way to return home. And even in a lot of the best case scenarios, if these kids do end up succeeding, all these scouts force them to sign contracts requiring them to pay up to 40% of all of their future earnings if they do end up playing professionally. Now, I say all that to say this. The goal of this video is to show two things. One, that there are greater tragedies in sport than we're aware of. And two, as a reminder, that for every success story, for every Joel Embiid or Serge Ibaka or Taco Fall, who mind you has a pretty crazy story himself, for each of these success stories, there are hundreds of athletes that were scammed, harmed, or worse, abandoned by men making promises to their families that they never planned to keep. Now, that being said, I don't like leaving these videos with at least some semblance of positivity or optimism. I'm a happy guy. The landscape in Africa is changing, as the NBA themselves have continued to invest in the continent, building academies and eliminating the need for athletes to travel to the other side of the world to chase their hoop dreams and gain exposure. Now, the scale of these academies are still small, nowhere near the scale needed to eliminate the risk of athletes coming to the US and being abandoned. The NBA's academies host 15 kids at a time, which is small, but it's a step in the right direction. And with other investments like the development of the Basketball Africa League, a Euro League or Champions League equivalent for basketball in Africa, the future is bright for these clubs to gain additional income, build their own academies, and continue to improve the youth development infrastructure in these countries. As someone whose family is from the continent, the prospect is exciting. I can't wait to see kids from where my family's from get the support and exposure they need to make a life out of the sport. And who knows, maybe in a few years, there will be a girl or boy born in Africa, trained in Africa, and drafted from Africa, living out the same hoop dreams I had as a kid. Now, wouldn't that be something? All right, y'all. Thank y'all so much for making it through another video. If you're new here and you liked it, please, please, please hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. I know we're just starting out here. I know these videos are still a little bit rough, but any sort of support that we can get is greatly, greatly appreciated. All right, y'all. Have a great rest of your day. Love y'all. Peace. Y'all not gonna believe this. I just killed a bottle of what I thought was discontinued, but they still make it. They still make Sprite Zero. But they brought they brought the Sprite Zero back, y'all. Y'all is they they got Sprite Zero back. Oh my goodness. Uh, I wish I would have saved some. Oh, there's still like a little bit left. Hold on. Hold on. Every last drop counts. Every last drop. Hold on. Mm. I'm so happy they brought back Sprite Zero. <laughs> uh, I'm such an idiot. <sighs>